internet, and welcome to episode 5 of On War the Podcast. My name's Alistair, and I'm joined again by my good friend and colleague Austin. And in this episode, we're taking a look at the little wars of insurgency and insurrection, asking the question, has this become the modern way of doing war? So, today in this episode, we're dealing with insurgency, and arguably this has become, or at least within popular history, I think. This has become one of the major f- defining forms of modern war. I've got a quote here I just want to open up with uh, from John McKinley, who's a, one of the many uh, soldier scholars who have written on this subject. Uh, John McKinley was uh, with the, uh, and served in the British Army for a number of years before becoming an academic studying security studies. Anyway, he says that In the prevailing era of international conflict, more and more violence is explained by the concept of insurgency. However, as we use the word more freely, it grows less and less precise. I think this is actually a pretty good statement about this. Insurgency is one of those things that, and this is a theme throughout, I think, what we've talked about in the podcast. In security studies, you get these almost flavor of the month concepts where everyone thinks that what they're doing is new and everything can be covered by this banner. Now, insurgency is currently how the majority of conflicts are running, but it's certainly not the new or the existential threat that it appears to be in certain literature, particularly the conventional school. And that's the issue we have. And this is what the quote points out, is that like its cousin, terrorism, the more we use insurgency to describe just generically conflict, the less and less useful it becomes as a term for academic parlance. Yeah, you bring up a very important point with the use of terrorism, and this is something we're going to be exploring much more deeply in the next episode, specifically on that topic. But these terms become politically coloured. An insurgency comes to be defined as any asymmetrical conflict. Often, they're much more complex than that. And terrorism has, in the modern environment and particularly in modern theaters of operation often becomes synonymous with with insurgency to the point where i where i can't count the number of times in the literature i've seen a a terrorist insurgency like the two terms grouped together but as you say it's got a much older history than that for starters exactly and and this is sort of what that quote points out jenkins also has has said that uh describing something he he uses the term terrorism but in this conflict context the the quote can be applied to insurgency. It it comes or it's come to be attached with its own moral imperative. Thereby, in the discourse, if you manage to convince more and more people to describe what is going on as either a terrorist action or an ongoing insurgency, then you co-opt people, you co-opt the listeners into your moral viewpoint on that conflict. And that's something we see in Iraq. Afghanistan, but also uh, if we look at something like the Vietnam War, and we talk about that as, as context moving on forward. Within that emotive context, you sort of get the problems of today being projected as something new or different from what's come before. But like we've alluded to just before, this has a, a much older history. So McKinley in his book, Insurgent Archipelago, which is in our notes for this uh, episode, and if you want further reading on the subject, it's definitely one of the books you should be looking at. Uh, but he starts his piece by claiming that the prototype of modern insurgency, and he goes to great pains to explain that this kind of conflict has occurred many times before, but the genesis of the modern insurgency could be found in the actions of Mao Zedong and the revolution in China. He's, he's claimed to this as that, that Mao's insurgency depended much more closely on popular support and popular mobilization and consent than perhaps conventional guerrilla warfare living off the land and hiding in the jungle, so to speak. So it was, a, it was first and foremost a political and a po- popular movement. It was also in the interwar period where modern conflict was, of course, evolving, so it doesn't have the trappings perhaps of the Napoleonic Wars peninsula campaign where the Spanish Little War, uh, the Guerra de Guerrillas, came about. Or, But this was much more of a modern conflict. Absolutely. And, you know, Tabor has also said that the reason that we say Mao Zedong is campaign is the first modern insurgency is because previous insurgencies and, you know, every rebellion down to Spartacus 
was effectively an insurgency. That's what it is. Um, so, you know, I could sit here for hours and list off uh, ancient and early modern insurgencies, but I'll just cover a couple. What Tabor talks about, though, is that in those time periods, in ancient and early modern uh, sort of up until the Middle Ages insurgencies, the actual impact, economically speaking and societally speaking, of your individual guerrilla or, you know, small bands of guerrillas was unimportant because they were subsistence farmers. So all they did by stopping production was starve themselves. So the state didn't care. That said, we do have many instances of pre-modern insurgency. The most common they referred to beginning of the guerrilla war, which is where the term comes from, of course, is the Peninsula Campaign, as you mentioned, with the Spanish, the little war they were conducting, which was actually, and, and pretty importantly, is the precursor, in fact, for sp state-sponsored guerrilla warfare, because the British and the Portuguese, but most of the British, were funding and militarily supporting the Spanish with arms, money, and advisors in the same way as you see in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Syria, more importantly, with the Russians. Equally, though, let's say 15, 20 years earlier, and you have the campaigns in the Vendee, or the Republicans, sorry, the Royalists trying to fight the Republicans, which led, of course, to the, the infamous hell columns, killed thousands of civilians in pursuit of what were just rebels considered at that point. So, if we want to talk about a politicized term, insurgency certainly has become a politicized term that comes with its own history that cherry picks in the academic literature from a number of what we would otherwise call low intensity conflicts in order to create this narrative that fits the modern insurgent as an archetype. I guess one of the things we're sort of reaching part four in the, the first part of this episode is, is to try and reach a definition. And in my own work, I tend to bundle insurgency and asymmetrical conflict in general into one broader package because often the conflicts you look at they move between different kind of phases some of which might be insurgency others might be civil war and so on so the way i would tend to define define it is the engagement in an armed conflict in pursuit of clear definable political goals so it's war as broadly defined by clausewitz's maxim between a numerically and technologically superior conventional force this is sort of normally a national foreign army, although recently we've seen PMCs and others playing a role, and a vastly smaller force, which, and this is the important bit, which avoids direct confrontation with its enemy, relying instead on hit-and-run attacks, ambushes, and other in indirect attacks, in order to wear down the support and logistical capacity of its enemy. That is, a war that's asymmetrical in its antagonists, tactics, and every other aspect of its conduct. That's the definition I've used in my own work. Have you got something different? Now, that's the definition I've used. I've also used the uh, definitions contained in the U.S. Field Manual, which we'll put in the, the source literature. I think that, by and large, though, what we consider an insurgent conflict is defined largely by the discourse that surrounds it, which is interesting. So I think that definition, while it's good, and that's the one I would use, is only the starting point for delineating asymmetric conflicts. Yeah, and it's, I mean, insurgency's only been one word to describe it. I mean, the British for a very long period of time prefers the term police action, uh, or perhaps the, mo the most interesting in, in the Malayan emergency. And much like the term insurgency itself, it's a way of delegitimizing the conflict. So, so what are the key kind of aspects we want to unpack from this? How are the conflicts understood? And, and I sort of more importantly, uh, how are they conducted? from the perspective of the insurgents themselves, I think is probably the more interesting and the more useful perspective when you're analysing this kind of conflict. Both McKinley and Tabor um, and many other authors have sort of isolated these into sort of three key areas. The first, and I would argue the most important, is that insurgencies always operate on the basis of popular consent. I wouldn't go as far as to say popular support, but popular consent. They derive their support base from the populations they operate in, and they draw recruitment, shelter, and logistical supplies from within this group. Uh, time and time again, conflicts have shown that without the support, for example, in Malaya, Mao's own insurgency nearly died in the outset without it. The, the insurgency always dies. The implication of this is that the contest is always political, not military. In fact, individual military engagements are often meaningless 
outside of this context. This is the, the war of the hearts and minds is how the, it's been come to know in modern parlance. Absolutely. And, and it's really interesting, just quickly before we continue on with your point, Al- Alistair, Mao Zedong, when he was really hard pressed, actually relied on the support of his communist Korean neighbor in North Korea, who gave him shelter and protected him from the nationalists. That's actually something that is still having political impacts even today between the Chinese and North Koreans. It's worth looking at, even though these conflicts are over for, you know, 60 years, they can still have an impact. Now, well, you mentioned public support, and I would agree. You know, no insurgency can function without public public condoning, as you as you mentioned the distinction. But it also is worth pointing out that this doesn't have to be the whole of the population, or even the majority of the population. All it has to be is a relatively significant minority who, of them, the majority are willing to at least facilitate, at least condone the or accept the ongoing actions of those militants, those insurgents. And as the insurgency gains ground and commits to more and more, I guess, technical or traditionally uh, expected military action, that level of uh, support has to increase as well. No insurgency can survive if their population turns against them. You see this... As well in, in Afghanistan, the Taliban opt- adopted a series of, of slogans in, in early 2006 to sort of put forward a, a political platform, if you like, although they weren't contesting any elections per se. Things like our party, the Taliban, our people and nation, the Pashtun, our economy, the Poppy, our constitution, the Sharia, and our form of government, the Emirate. I mean, these, these were political slogans. They were rallying calls just like any election. So that was just sort of the first of the three points we wanted to look at. The second, and almost as important, particularly when you're looking in the way that ideas of conflict become institutionalized, both in literature and in the manuals and doctrine of armed forces that engage in them, uh, is that insurgencies, by their very nature, are very fluid. Techniques and weapons vary across time, geography, and culture. Generally speaking, you can kind of constrain it to hit-and-run tactics and assassinations, things that are a maximum damage with minimum expenditure, because any any insurgent force, by definition, does not have much in the way of manpower or equipment. But what becomes available at the time, what's expedient and what's allowed, really shifts. One example of this is one of the surprising out- outcomes of a successful American uh, infrastructure development program in Iraq uh, was the creation of, of a stable cell phone network. The outcome of this was, well, one of the outcomes of this was in how IEDs were detonated. Uh, You moved away from command detonation or suicide detonation, both of which were, well, command line detonation much easier to detect and suicide detonation expensive in terms of manpower, definitely, to mobile phones. And in the early days of the conflict, this was really problematic. Now, of course, a lot of electronic warfare stuff got up at this point and and there were responses to it. But you could see how a change in ground circumstances shifts the the tactics used. Uh, Another thing was the the lack of security around Iraqi Republic Army facilities allowed the proliferation of small arms and explosives that allowed the insurgency to jumpstart in a way that's relatively uncommon for insurgencies. There is a lot of work that's been done on innovation by violent non-state groups, be they terrorist groups, be they insurgent forces, be they partners in a civil war. By and large, the tactics will shift depending on a couple of factors. The first is, as you mentioned, what's available slash what will be accepted by um, the people that are supporting them. And that that's important, right? You can't undervalue the restraining power of um, the supporters of that organisation. Take Catalonia, for instance, Catalonia and the independence movement in Spain. There is a level of violence that their support base will allow, and that limits their ability to conduct certain attacks. The second factor I would say in determining their ability or their weapon choice, their tactical choices, is simply the ability to have the competency to do that. Now, a lot has been made on the internet over the past couple of years of the ease of making an IED. Now, I'm sure neither of us, Alistair, is willing to speak on how the difficulty of doing that, but it's actually relatively difficult 
when you're not in a first world country and you don't have the knowledge. Now, the internet's come a long way, but beyond that, what we see is almost a brain swap, right? You hear about brain drain in the Western world, but we do have foreign fighters who will go between insurgent groups drawn by money or ideology or simply sent as part of a partnership between the two organizations. The IRA is a fantastic example of what I'm talking about here. Indeed, they were sent to Colombia. From our previous episode's example, there was a, a famous case of three IRA, or three Irish, almost certainly IRA members who went there almost certainly for training purposes. So Yeah, and there was the case of, a very famous case of Al-Qaeda sending emissaries to, tr- to Somalia to try and recruit and train Somali militants, and none of them came back alive. So this is one of those things. Again, we're looking at tactics that would change depending on the individual circumstances of that group. And so the third kind of key factor we want to look at here is that from a societal perspective, or at least when you're looking at the segment of society that is consenting to this conduct, not just the the, the segment that's actually engaging in violence, is that it's an act of last resort, or at least it's been painted that way by the people uh, carrying out the violence. Now, McKinley doesn't actually put in that last qualifier, but I think it is it is important to do so because we are dealing with a wide range of political and sometimes religious ideologies that perhaps, are, when analysed from a different perspective, that's not the case, that it isn't the only option left. But for the people engaging in it, they truly believe it is. They have to be con- convinced that this is the last best hope for their voices to be heard. Tabor has a very good quote on the kind of duality of this. Viewed from one standpoint, insurgency is a potent weapon. It can be a sort of national liberation and social justice. Viewed from another, it's a subversive and sinister process, a plague of dragon's teeth sown in confusion, nourished in the soil of social dissension, economic disruption and political chaos, causing armed fanatics to spring up where peasants once toiled. And that's the duality you see. These conflicts are always incredibly polarizing in their actions, and that points quite directly to their political rather than military nature. Absolutely. There's arguably no form of warfare or conflict that we could look at that is more politicized than insurgencies. Now, of course, our audience is going to be most interested, I think, in in the more recent conflicts of Iraq and, and Afghanistan, and indeed the global war on terror is pretty much our generation's war, if you like, is continuing today in the conflicts in Syria and Iraq and even resurgent conflict in Afghanistan. And this brought with it a resurgent interest in trying to understand and explain this form of conflict. There's a a popular Australian soldier scholar, um, David Kilcullen, who had one particularly interesting take on this, his idea of accidental guerrilla syndrome, which grew particularly out of analysis of... Uh, al-Qaeda and its actions both after and before the 2001 attack. He was responding to the still very popular idea of of global Islamic insurgency as a sort of a franchise thing. You you would have encountered this in your own work. Yeah, um, it was extremely popular for a while there, based on people's reactions to September 11 and particularly as a result of organizations like al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb popping up. But the basic idea was that local organizations would take on the banner independent of any real connection and sort of become the the McDonald's of of Islamic insurgency in their particular country with their own owner managers and so on, but without any real connection. Is that the basic idea? It, It is, and you can see why this came out of largely conventional works. And this again comes down to that point that was raised earlier, which is that if you manage to describe something as a terrorist organization or a certain type of insurgency, then it opens up different avenues for you morally. In this case, it allowed access to US funding. If you had an organization pop up, no matter how small, that said, oh, we're the local Al-Qaeda, suddenly you had access to a whole bunch of F-22s and Predator drones. So this worked really well for that aspect. So in response to this, Kilcullen, who disagreed with this much like we do, came up with this idea of the accidental guerrilla syndrome. This is where local and international actors are in a much more complicated and cyclical game with each other. And he identified or proposed four stages. The first stage, which he termed infection, was when small transnational radical groups established some kind of safe haven in an area of existing conflict or unstable governance. 
the important point here is that there's some kind of instability or conflict already present. Uh, organizations like the broader Al Qaeda base, on, as a global from a global perspective, aren't creating conflict out of nothing. So it's not a, a franchise that pops up. It's there's something already going on. Then the second stage, contagion, it begins to spread. They try and infiltrate local and state inst institutions. They violently suppress opposition, and the, the general idea is to raise the profile of the insurgency. Once it's sufficiently high, the third step kicks off, where external authorities come in to suppress the insurgency, either at a local level from government forces or police, or the global level, like you're alluding to before, with multinational interventions typified by, for example, Afghanistan or uh, the conflict now in Syria or Iraq. This intervention triggers the final stage, where locals, um, the previous actors of the, of the local conflict, close ranks against the foreign force now invading their territory, uh, inadvertently incorporating those insurgents into a sort of us against the them of the interventionists. This isn't anything particularly new, but it allowed for a localization of transnational actors in a way that the franchise theory really didn't. Yeah, and certainly it gained some traction when it came out, just based on the, the post-9-11 view of the world and the reaction to your franchise model, which I started to realize didn't work. Now, arguably, this does make sense for certain organizations, and it does go some way to explaining the influence of foreign fighters. Equally, though, it doesn't account for things like you, ISIS, for instance, and the Al Nusra Front, who are both separated from Al Qaeda. Um, it, it also doesn't account for organizations uh, like in the Philippines, where they've split. So I think that as a theory, it makes a little bit of sense. But it's worth remembering that these insurgencies are very much based on the individual circumstances of those involved. And there is a danger always in assuming that your transnational actors will intentionally or otherwise actually end up influencing the people on the ground of either side. I think there's also a, a real kind of factor here. I mean, the two of the authors, at least we've mentioned so far, McKinley and, um, Kilcullen, both are the soldier scholars, people who've, who've worked in the military and then gone on to pursue strategic uh, studies or conflict studies at, at a um, through research. And there is an element often I find in the, their works, although I think it's probably the most valuable because they often toe that line between more conventional action-oriented focus, but also a sort of self-reflection of their own experiences and how things went badly when those approaches were taken. So they do occupy this sort of theoretical middle ground, which I quite like, but they often get caught up in fighting the wars that they were a part of all over again. I think McKinley's particularly sort of self-reflective of this, although he still falls to his own bias on it. Uh, I don't think Kilcullen is perhaps as reflective on this in at least that work as he could have been. So you do get this element of sort of uh, the old adage of, of generals always fighting the, the, the last war. And once that catches on, once that becomes popular in any particular field, of course it becomes the norm, it becomes the, the flavor of the month. But because these conflicts are so varied, kind of dynamic in their nature, you can't start applying the lessons, for example, of Al-Qaeda onto a group like the Islamic State. Absolutely agree with you there. And I think the flip, sorry, the additional aspect of that to remember is that Kilcullen was a senior policy advisor for the US government and the US military, and he continues to play a... Um, leading role in the conventional approach to this sort of work. In that respect, you know, it makes sense that his work is devoted to a much more government response orientated view of in how insurgency spread. Um, and also looking at reasons for what he would have seen firsthand, the fixation that occurred on Al Qaeda in the sort of 2001 to 2010 time period. So the other aspect of, of insurgencies that I think is important to look at is that they're often, particularly from either a, a basic military historian's perspective or a conventional understanding's perspective, and often in the critical literature as well, they're often seen as impossible to overcome. And, and McKinley even says that the West has had a, a very bad track record with these kinds of conflicts. But as we've already alluded to, they're not unbeatable. They're not sort of an ultimate answer to the Western way of doing war, although we tend to fumble with them. The best kind of example I've seen 
of a victory, if you like, against insurgency. Although, I don't want to use the term victory here. Perhaps a, a success encountering an insurgency is a better way of terming it. I was in the 1950s in the Philippines during the Huck Rebellion. There's been an ongoing insurgency for some time, but in the early mid-1950s, Magsaysay uh, was elected president, and he sort of, he'd been an insurgent fighter himself against the Japanese, I believe, in the Second World War. Correct me if I'm wrong here. He was, but he also um, participated in the anti-Huck campaign before he became president. He was the assistant secretary for national defense. Sorry, the secretary of national defense. So he'd had a lot of direct experience in this kind of conflict. Um, and when he was elected president, he took a couple of measures that were really quite interesting. The first of which was to completely restructure the Philippine Constabulary, which had taken on a very militarized role in combating the insurgency. And often, particularly outside of um, urban centers, had taken quite a corrupt nature as they'd acquired sort of more coercive means to engage the insurgency. They'd also sadly use those on the, on the locals for extortion purposes. Um, and so he completely restructured the police body and its, the spokes of its paramilitary security force and refocused it entirely towards criminal investigation and sort of community um, integration and back to being standard kind of coppers, if you like. Uh, he did the opposite with the armed forces. He focused that on projecting an external security in the outlying regions, particularly in, in non-populated areas. But he also took a second step, and he involved both the police and especially the armed forces in community outreach work, particularly infrastructure development. They're often seen sort of the army in uniform building you a nice road. So it was a way of boosting the legitimacy of the, the branches of the state traditionally been associated with um, the projection of force and the, the carrying out of the state's hopefully legitimate uh, monopoly on the use of violence in a way that was supposed to sort of uh, de-escalate the, the locals' perception of the state and directly attack that popular consent. Then on the other side of, of things, he stepped up the army's kind of kinetic um, operations, be the modern term. Uh, instead of uh, allowing the police and, and paramilitaries to sort of operate around the villages and often take in collateral damage, he'd project the army out on lengthy patrols in force out to the jungle to attack insurgents directly where they were hiding, while also putting forward a a sort of amnesty for anyone who'd come forward and surrender, an amnesty that was by and large honoured, as I understand it. What's really interesting as well is that you see the arrival of the sort of the quintessential man in the dark sunglasses um, here, and there's a, his name is a Edward Lansdale, who's a colonel in the US Air Force, who was also working for the CIA. Um, and he also pops up quite a lot in the early stages of the Vietnam War. And if you've ever read a book called The Quiet American, um, he's allegedly the uh, inspiration for the titular character, although it's certainly not a, 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 a flattering portrayal. And he's subsequently um, revealed that he did not have good relations with the journalist that wrote the book, Graham Greene. Um, Edward Lansdale was a was basically brought in to help, like I say, um, curb the insurrection. And the reason I bring him up is it's one of those things in our line of research that you think truth is often stranger in fiction when you're looking at insurgent conflicts. And here's an, an example. He did two things that I think are, are, are certainly worth looking at. And before I start, it's worth noting that he's an ex he remains an extremely controversial figure. A lot of what he did was was quite brutal. For example, the Filipinos have this myth of a vampire. A uh, vampire myth was extremely strong at the time. And so what uh, Colonel Lansdale would have his troops do is they would abduct the last member in a patrol and did this once a month or so. And they quietly grab him off the back of the line, kill him, punch two holes in his neck and hang him up from a tree. And then when the patrol came back looking for their friend, they found him. And it looked like he'd been attacked by the vampire. And so he was able to increase the fear there and so this is this is the beginning of what we see as american psyops in iraq and afghanistan and also in vietnam um the guy's been linked to some pretty pretty bad stuff finally and, and this is this is one of those truth strange in the fiction bits that, that sort of you know takes us out of some of the darkness of this sort of stuff they were having issues with large-scale peaceful protests and they'd been trying to stop them with the paramilitaries but as part of 
uh, de-escalation, they were trying not to do that anymore. So what Ed Lansdale decided to do was he sent a single undercover operative into the crowd with a drinks cart. You know, the operative would hand out cups of hot coffee and hot chocolate to the participants. Of course, the drinks were laced with a really powerful laxative. So the, the demonstrations stopped rather abruptly. And I think when we go into terrorism next episode, there's a lot more stories like that where a lot of what we look at here is, is while it's often tragic and often brutal, there are some instances where you just got to laugh. Some counterinsurgency methods are very effective because they're not violent. And I think that's a good shining light in that aspect of the counterinsurgency campaign. Yeah, and on that note, perhaps the, I don't want to say serious because it was actually a very, <laughs> very useful tactic. Um, but some of the criticisms, particularly of the US occupation of Iraq, was the way it was very light on uh, occupation style forces, military police, federalized police, you know, uh, like US marshals, or I'm not sure what the appropriate branch of the US would be. Um, Australia often deploys Australian federal police to uh, fill, fill this role of uh, local police or training local police when, when a, a regime change occurs. But they were very light on that kind of occupational governing ability. And so in Iraq, what happened was the public order completely disintegrated. And so alongside the lack of security on arms and material from the Iraqi army, you also had the sudden breakdown of law and order across all of, uh, across all of Iraq, particularly in Baghdad. Um, which provided insurgents with a, a, a pool of very angry, disaffected, particularly young men. So the provision of security and, and the rule of law is really important in counterinsurgency operations, but uh, it can't come at a cost of oppression, which is often the way it goes. The final thing we've really got to address is sort of, firstly, are they wars? And I guess that's going to be argued both ways, depending on the context. But I, I think the more important question is, is insurgency the new way of war, as it's as it's often touted to be? I think this is the culmination of a lot of stuff we've talked about. It certainly appears that as we go further and further into modern conflict, the effectively, for want of a better term, cost of entry to participate in a conventional war, as we would understand it, goes up in terms of money, other resources, and technologically superior military equipment. And so what has always been around as a method of warfare, and I would argue the most common method of warfare, insurgency or rebellion, whatever the term you want to use, is increasingly becoming what we hear about, simply because there is a lack of conflict that our states, in, by which I mean Western states, are directly involved in. And therefore, we have this level of observation bias that is partly a result of where we stand and where our information comes from, but also because of the increasingly international order that is around, that is designed by and large, and the UN is a part of this, to prevent interstate conflict between all but the most minor of states. I think there are other observational biases going on here as well. The first, I think, is a tendency to look at conflicts that are much more complicated and paint them as one thing. So the three we've talked about tonight uh, Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. Vietnam, and we haven't really gone into the history of this because we may or may not do an actual episode on this in the future, but Vietnam arguably is, is a much more hybridized war involving, uh, in the conduct of the North Vietnamese armed forces, which North Vietnam was its own state at the time, partially conventional. I mean, you had North Vietnamese air forces clashing with the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy and Marines over North Vietnam. You had North Vietnamese regular units operating, you know, as regiments, battalions, and so on, as well as an insurgency. In Iraq, while the majority of the conflict is almost certainly should be considered an insurgency, it began as a conventional, although highly one-sided, war between two nation states. And at its peak in between 2006 and 2009, it was a civil war between, well, at least three different sides, uh, not an insurgency at all. And Afghanistan... Well, that's a very complicated case with its own lock history, but arguably is a, the only one of the three that's stayed the truest to a, a conventional understanding as an insurgency. The other bias, the other observational bias I'd point to is that whenever you focus on one particular thing as a researcher or an author or as a student, you always look, you know, to a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, but 
there are many interstate conflicts, even in modern towns. I mean, the first Gulf War, uh, the conflict in the U Ukraine is, is much more complicated and involves national forces. The Georgian War, as well as other more complicated conflicts like peacekeeping operations, which we touched on last episode, and civil wars more generally. So I think, although certainly insurgency is very dominant, and as you say, the cost of entry is, um, for many modern states is very high to a conflict, that doesn't mean they don't enter into them, and it doesn't mean that there aren't other conflicts going on. Well, we're rapidly running out of time, and I'm very conscious of not doing what we did last episode and running way over. Uh, any closing comments on this, Austin? I think that this is an enormous cult topic, and this episode certainly isn't attempting to explain all of the concept of insurgency. In the next couple of episodes, we're going to be talking about terrorism and a few other things that will branch out of this concept of asymmetric warfare, of which insurgency is the most common iteration. Um, so I think this this episode has to be viewed in conjunction with its successors. And also, this podcast as a whole really should be seen as as a as an introduction to people who are interested in learning more. I mean, obviously, if your interest is sated by these half hour episodes, that's fantastic, and we aim to give you as good an introduction or as good a coverage as we can in that time. But perhaps the best way that this podcast can be utilized is to serve as that prompter to, to sort of wet your whistle from where you can go and look at our sources and reading lists that we post or explore entirely on your own, be it through a university course or just through your own exploration. Certainly there are lots of options in this wonderful modern world of the internet to, to conduct your own individual research and expand your own understanding. So it's in that light that many of these episodes, and in fact this entire series, are structured. For this episode, however, we're completely out of time. If you've enjoyed the show, and have some ideas of some of the topics you'd like us to cover, why not send us your thoughts? Be it by email, on our blog, or through the comments section below, we're always open to hearing feedback from our listeners, especially in shaping the show to cover the issues that interest you. If you'd like to support us more directly, please consider visiting our Patreon page. Our patrons get our episodes first, as well as having the opportunity to join us in special live stream episodes, while their support helps us improve the quality of the show from the source material we use to the equipment we record with. If you want further reading on today's episode, or any of the previous ones, you can find them on our blog at www.onwarthepodcast.wordpress.com. Join us next week as we conclude this three-part series of the modern not wars with a discussion on terrorism and its impact both at home and abroad. Once again, thank you for listening and good night.